reading to us uh, from that passage of Scripture in Galatians chapter 6. And so I'm just going to invite you to stand, uh, shake a hand around you, and uh, wish somebody a happy Father's Day uh, around you and uh, to the dads. And welcome somebody here. So. <clears throat> All right, you can go ahead and grab a seat. Love that sound. And I also um so thankful for the songs that we sung, uh, you know, this morning. And uh, I, I love... Um, I'm so glad Henry remembers that wedding, your wedding now. That was fantastic. So, but, uh, um, but I also just so appreciate, it. I so appreciate that song, Jesus um, Strong and Kind, and just the chorus, just standing back there and just being reminded of the faithfulness of, a God, of our God, and, uh, and then Henry pointing that out again, and just so appreciating the way you just shared with us, to be reminded of how faithful God was. And as Brad alluded to earlier, um, Sunday mornings, um, we are going to uh, do our prayer time from 10 to 10.30, uh, and we really want to encourage you to be there. And, and our plan, as Brad said, is to walk through the Psalms. This morning, we walked through Psalm 103, and, uh, and I found it so neat because I, uh, you know, I'd been thinking of Psalm 103 already because of the fact that uh, we're going to allude to that this morning in our message a little bit. But, um, but I, uh, I got up this morning, and my phone, it has an app on it that gives me a verse of the day. And of course, Psalm 103, or today, the verse of the day was Psalm 103, 13, which says, as a father has compassion upon his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And, uh, and I thought, I was like, oh man, that's a great psalm for Father's Day too. And so, uh, so it was just neat to be able to, to pray through and be reminded of the character of God through Psalm 103. And so again, really want to encourage you, uh, be here 10, 10 to 1030. Uh, you're used to being here at 945 for those who come for Sunday school, so you actually get to sleep in for 15 minutes. Uh, but just really want to encourage you to be here throughout the summer as we go through the psalms in our time together. But if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 18 to 29. But as you are turning there, I want to uh, say to all of the fathers this morning, Happy Father's Day. Uh, And we are so thankful for you and for the gifts, uh, and thanking God for the gifts of fathers. Um, But uh, also continue to recognize, as I was thinking about this this week, also we continue to recognize the importance of, of the role of the father in not only the life of uh, his children who are at home, but also children who are grown up and away from home. Uh, that whether it's a baby or a grown adult, there is an important role that God has given to the, uh, to the role of the father. And um, this Father's Day is actually pretty special for me, as for the first time in, I think, 22 years, um, I am actually with my, with my dad on Father's Day. And... And that's incredibly special to me. Uh, And so it's nice not to have to be able to pick up the phone and call him today. And I've been so thankful uh, for uh, his challenge and for his encouragement in my life. And so, again, I speak with that. Uh, Even when your kids are grown and away from home, it's still important to be in their lives. And so, uh, so we want to pray for our fathers this morning, but also... Uh, this morning, as many of you know, and this is the reason why we have the basket here on the stage this morning, uh, we began a bought baby bottle drive that started on Mother's Day and, and concluded today with, in support of the ministry of Hope's Journey Home, a, a, a maternity home that is uh, being established in Portage La Prairie. And so uh, many of you, and I'm so thankful, I'm so excited about this. Many of you took bottles, took them home, filled with money. Some of you brought them back again. We do need them back sometime this week, but we've said all along that what we want to do is we want to spend some time praying uh, for Hope's Journey Home this morning as we commit not only them, but also these gifts to the Lord. The, the Lord would not just, uh, I remember when, uh, when Don was on the um, steering committee that started um, the uh, Prairie Pregnancy Support Center. One of the prayers that was prayed in those first prayer meetings was, Lord, don't just save these babies physically, but save them spiritually. 
And that really becomes our prayer, even as each mom or goes into this maternity home, is that we would not just be praying for their physical being, but we would also be praying for their spiritual being. And so we want to commit uh, Hope's Journey home uh, to the Lord as well. And so I just want to invite you to, uh, to bow with me as we commit uh, these things to the Lord and commit our message time. So let's pray. So Father, thank you. Oh, Lord, I thank you for the fact that even as we start our prayer, as we start this prayer, Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to call you Father. Um, you, as, as Jesus taught us to pray, he taught us to pray our Father. Again, being remi- reminding us this morning that you are relational. And you desire your children not to be robots. You desire, you desire us not to be just, uh, just a person. But Father, you have saved us and you have adopted us as sons and daughters. And so Lord, I thank you this morning again, not only the, for the fact that you are Father... But I also thank you for the role of father. And I thank you for the privilege of being a father. And Lord, I I continue to pray for my brothers in this room right now. And who are listening in this role of fathers. Lord, I, I, I pray your continued leading, your continued blessing, your continued guidance, direction, wisdom. Lord, Lord, whether our children are babies or whether they're grown adults, Father, you continue to call us to speak into the lives of our children. And so I pray that you would bless my brothers this morning again and that you would encourage them. That you would challenge us to continue in this role. That, and Lord, that you would lead us as we lead our families. Father, I, I thank you so much, though, for uh, just this time to be able to remember and to celebrate And God, we just continue to lift our fathers into your hands and just pray, pray, God, that you would go before us. Father, we also thank you for this moment to be able to commit uh, Hope's Journey Home into your hands. And Lord, I thank you for these ministries that are speaking to those in crisis pregnancy, be it either Hope's Journey Home, be it Prairie Pregnancy Support Center, be it the centers across, the, across our, our country and our world. Again, Father, we know, as, as, as Brad alluded to earlier this morning, Lord, you are the giver of life, and we thank you again for the reminder of that through even Jane's birth this, this week. But Father, we also recognize that we are living in a day and age that is becoming more and more hostile to you and to your word and to the sanctity of life. And so, Father, I pray this morning once again for Hope's Journey Home. Lord, as, as you lead them, as you, as you direct them in, in the building of this home, but also, Lord, as you lead the, these, these women who will be in this home, Father, I pray for them and I pray also for the babies that will, that will be part of this home. God, I ask and pray today once again that you would just not save them physically, that you would not tend to them just physically, but Father, spiritually as well. Lord, I pray for those who will be the staff in the home. God, I ask and pray that again, that you would minister through them. And Lord, I pray uh, again, Father, that you would give them words, give them wisdom. We pray for the board that you would give them wisdom as they continue to prepare for the building of this home. But Lord, we also want to commit this, these funds to you. God, once again, recognizing that, you, that you, we are stewards of what you have given to us. And so, Lord, as, as we give of what we have been given, Father, we pray that you would take these funds and that you would bless them, that you would use them for the furtherance of your kingdom in, 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 the, in, this, in this home. And so, Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of partnering in ministry with you. Lord, as we come to the book of Hebrews, Father, I thank you so much for this series. And Lord, today as we move to the conclusion, in, as, we, as we're beginning this, this step towards the conclusion of the series, uh, as we move to the final section of Hebrews chapter 12 and then into Hebrews chapter 13 in the next couple of weeks, Lord, I pray once again that you would continue to speak to us as you have. Lord, I pray that you would find uh, your servants ready to listen, but not just listen but, Lord, to respond to that which you have for us this morning. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to open your word. And, God, I pray once again that you would help me to speak no more and no less than what it is that you have for us this morning. So we pray, speak, O Lord, and may, your, may you find your servants listening. And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 29. Now some of you may be wondering, well, are we not jumping over Hebrews chapter 12, verse 13 to 17? And the answer to that question is kind of. Uh, The reason that we're doing that is because Richard Giesbrecht, who was supposed to be preaching last Sunday... Uh, was actually using this passage of scripture. And Richard is actually going to come at a later date and actually preach this passage. And so we are going to leave that for him uh, until he comes and shares with us in the next month or so. And so we come to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 to 29. Now, I love this passage so much because as I have read the book of Hebrews so many different times in my life, I've, always, I've, I've, I've come to appreciate two, two verses in Hebrews chapter 12. The first one, of course, is our theme verse for this series of Hebrews 12, 2, looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame and is seated at the right hand of God. But the second one is in our passage this morning, and I want you to see it, and then we're going to go back and, and look at the whole passage today, but it's verses 28, uh, verses 28 and 29, and here's what the writer of Hebrews says there. He says, therefore, let us be grateful... For receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship. With reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, on October 17th, 1989, many homes across America and even into Canada tuned in for Game 3 of the World Series between the Oakland Athletics and the San Francisco Giants. And as they tuned into the game, the game was scheduled to start at 5.20 in the evening... But as they tuned in to see that game, they noticed something very different. The game wasn't starting. And that is because at 5.04 on October 17th, a magnitude 6.9 earthquake struck San Francisco, the San Francisco Bay Area, killing 67 people and and, and creating $5 billion worth of damage in San Francisco and in Oakland. And as the game was beginning to televise, it was funny, you can actually go onto YouTube and actually see some of these things, because the guys were, some of these sports broadcasters were in the midst of their pregame, when all of a sudden you see, you hear some of them begin to shout, I think the ground is shaking. And then it dawned on them that they were having an earthquake. And the story that always stands out to me is that one of the starting pitchers of the Oakland Athletics was actually in the bullpen warming up. When the earthquake took place, and a, and, a, and a lady who had her baby there dropped her baby, and the pitcher caught him in his glove as he was getting ready to throw the ball back. And there was massive chaos going on in San Francisco during that time. And yet, as I thought about that story, it is amazing to me the great fear that happens when something or someone is shaken. And as we, continued in our, as we continue in our series, Jesus is greater, and really in chapters 10, 11, and, or sorry, 10, 11, 12, and 13, we're asking the question, as we come to the realization that Jesus is greater, we're asking the question, so now what? The writer of Hebrews is going to bring us to a place of understanding that as we come to this realization, as we come to this understanding, as we come to this surrender that Jesus is greater, we have been given a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Not that will not be shaken, but cannot be shaken. And of course, over the last number of messages, we have looked at this theme of what does it mean to have biblical faith. And we were reminded through Hebrews chapter 11 and then beginning of, beginning of Hebrews chapter 12 that biblical faith is not cross your fingers and wish upon a star, but round it, rather it is grounded in the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It is forward looking and it is constantly fixing our eyes upon Jesus. But today we are going to be reminded through this text and through two mountains representing two covenants, we are going to be reminded through a warning, and then finally through the response of those who belong to the kingdom, that no matter what happens in our lives, when we belong to Jesus Christ, we belong to a kingdom that has hope. And so as I was thinking about this, as, as many camps are, being, are getting ready or gearing up for the beginning of their camp season, and we've been thinking a lot about Valley View. We've been thinking a lot about Torch Trail. But I remember as I, as I went to camp, as I've, I've spoken at camp at a number of different times, there's a song that kept coming into my head that, that I find that I often sing at camp. 
And I'm going to put the lyrics on the screen for you. And I know that many of you know this song. I'm not going to sing it for you. Don't worry. But, um, but here's the song. It says, I will declare my choice to the nations. I will shout for joy in the congregation. I will worship God all my days. Next line says, and those who love the Lord are satisfied. Those who trust in him are justified. I will serve my God all my days. And here's why it struck me again. It says, when the nations crumble, the word of the Lord will stand. Kings may rise and fall, but his love will endure. Though the strong may stumble, oh, the joy of the Lord is strength. To my soul, I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. And I really hope and pray that even as we've gone through the events of this week, right, I really hope and pray that despite our circumstances, that's the cry of our heart. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. As the writer of Hebrews brings us to this next exhortation in running the race, knowing that Jesus is greater, he drives us to ask this question in our lives. Do I belong to the kingdom that cannot be shaken? Or am I holding fast to the fleeting things of this world? So I want to read the text, and then we're going to break it down into three points, and then we're going to, as we consider this kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, and so in a way to honor the word of the Lord, I'm going to ask that you would stand with me as I read this passage for us, and then we're going to break it down to these three points. And so Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, And the sound of a trumpet and the voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages would be spoken to them. For they could not even, they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the immeasurable angels, the innumerable angels in the festival gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. And so as you have a seat, I want us to consider three points about this passage this morning, about this kingdom. And so here's point number one. Point number one is simply this, two mountains, two covenants. Two mountains, two covenants. And as we come to verses 18 to 24, the writer of Hebrews is going to use two mountains to represent the two covenants that we've talked about throughout the book of Hebrews. The differences symbolize the differences between the old covenant and between the new covenant. And as he does so, I want us to understand this morning, as he does so, he uses these two mountains to drive home the superiority of, of the new covenant. And as we consider, as we are reminded, as we've been reminded through this series, as we consider the people who the writer of Hebrews has been writing to, we were reminded from the very beginning, from all the way back as we started this series, that the book of Hebrews was written to a, pre, to a group of Jewish people who under fear of persecution, under the threat of persecution, were ready to abandon the faith in order to return to Judaism. And so the writer of Hebrews is reminding them these, and he's reminding them through these, by using these two mountains to express one point. That there is one mountain that represents fear and trembling and a reminder of how, a, a reminder of the barriers, but we've been given another one that's a reminder of hope and a reminder of joy and a reminder of worship and a reminder of a nearness to God. 
One commentator puts it this way as he explains the differences between the two. He says, Mount Sinai reminds us how unholy we are. Mount Zion reminds us how we have been made perfect in Christ. There's the difference between the two mountains. And as we come to these verses, in verses 18 to 21, we come to the first mountain. And what I find so interesting about the first mountain is that the writer of Hebrews doesn't even give us the name. He leaves this name, uh, he leaves this mountain uh, unnamed, but reminds us that it is so frightening, it is so terrifying in this scene. And demanded that... And in this moment, it was, there was the demand that not even the people or even the beasts could touch, touch this mountain. Now, we know the end of the story, but I want us to understand this morning is the Jewish people would have heard this. They would have been very well aware of what mountain the writer of Hebrews was talking about. For a Jewish person, the scene at Mount Sinai would have been so ingrained in their teaching, so ingrained in their history, that they didn't even need him to, refer, to know what mountain he was referring to. But look at verses 18 to 21, because it really sets the scene for us and just how terrifying Mount Sinai was. For there we read, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, And the sound of the trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the the order that was given, if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now, sometimes I think this is where we kind of miss the point. You know, there's, there's sometimes I think we, we think to ourselves, man, it'd be so much fun to go back to this point in Scripture, right? You know, what would it have been like to stand on Mount Sinai with Moses and receive the Ten Commandments? And yet, here again, Scripture reminds us this is a terrifying scene. This is one that's filled with, again, look at the words, blazing fire, darkness, gloom, tempest. And again, we're reminded through, and this scene is being played out in Exodus chapter 19, verse 12 to 25, where we're reminded that the Mosaic covenant was given and the law was given upon Sinai, but we're also reminded it was a fearful thing. Even the giving of the law was an incredibly frightening scene. As the commentator reminds us, as as we had that quote on the screen, the commentator reminds us that Sinai shows us that God is holy and we are not. And we are unable to ap- approach him in our unholy state. Now, I want us to understand as we, begin this, as we begin these two comparisons, the writer of Hebrews is not saying at Sinai we see God's holiness and then at, at Zion we see his love. Understand that God is just as much holy in Zion as he is in Sinai. And he's just as much love at Sinai as he is at Zion. He does not change in his character. But as we see with Sinai, the people could not touch the mountain as Moses gets, went to get the law because of the holiness of the moment. There was a barrier between them and God. And they were overwhelmed with fear. So to the point where, and, and you notice in the text, the writer says there, he says, so that to a point where the people just begged God not to give them any more messages. They couldn't even handle it. In fact, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, he says, they couldn't even handle the one that says, if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Like they couldn't even endure that one. And they were given so much more. Even our text tells us, and this was the, this was the, ver, uh, this was the part of the passage that really stood out to me is that even there, Moses stood with trembling fear. He, he says that. He says, I tremble with fear. Why? Because of the fact, again, he was being reminded, he was being told by God that God was going to destroy the children of Israel because of their idol worship of the golden calf while he was up on the mountain. Think about all that Moses had seen, and in this moment, he stands and says, I, I'm terrified with fear as I stand on Sinai. And so what does this show us? Well, I want us to see this, that all of this, I believe that all of this shows us that if we are going to try and earn God's presence with ourselves, with our works, or with our actions, then we have failed to understand two important principles. We have failed to understand the holiness of God and the unholiness of you and I. 
Let me repeat that again so we grasp that. If we are trying to earn God's presence by ourselves, by our works, or by our actions, we have failed to understand two important principles, the holiness of God and the unholiness of you and I. Let Mount Sinai remind us that we cannot do enough, we cannot be good enough to enter into God's presence because God is so holy and we are not. But, so there's, there, maybe we're like, okay, well, that's discouraging. But let Mount Sinai point you to Mount Zion and point you to the reminder of the new covenant represented by Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, because, the new, because through the new covenant, and more importantly, as I hope you have seen through this series, through the one who has come as the guarantor of this covenant, here it is, ready? We can now draw near to God. Thanks be to God, and I thought about this this week, thanks be to God, there wasn't just Sinai. But thanks be to God, here comes Zion. And look at verses 22 to 24. Here's the beauty. Now notice the first words that he says there. Verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem and to the innumerable angels in the festival gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are, all in, who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all and the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. While my, Mount Sinai is a place of fear, is a place of terror, is a place of of reminding of the barriers, Mount Zion, Mount Zion is a place of hope, is a place of worship, is a place of nearness to God. You see, it's interesting because Mount Zion is actually a real historical place. It's in Jerusalem. But the writer of Hebrews is reminding us also that Mount Zion is also a picture of the heavenly city of the living God. Mount Zion represents the new covenant that was created in Christ Jesus. And look at what the, again, look at what the writer of Hebrews says. He says it is, it is a place that has innumerable angels that are doing what? That are longing to worship God. It is a place of the assembly of the firstborn. Followers of Jesus Christ, understanding again that Jesus Christ is preeminent. Jesus Christ is prominent. Jesus Christ is the ultimate. But here we see the assembly of the firstborn. And that brought me to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 10, which is becoming one of my favorite verses in the book of Revelation that says, and when John says, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I said it to this to you a couple weeks ago. If you are bored of worship here on earth, good luck in heaven. Because that's what we're going to do. And we're not going to do it just with 125 people. We are going to do it with a number that no one can number. And notice again, and this just struck me as I was reading it right now, that again, think back to Palm Sunday. And what did the palm branches represent? They symbolized victory for the children, for, for Israel. They sim- that's what the palm branches in Israel's history uh, symbolized. And here again, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, what's our cry? Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. At Zion is the assembly of the firstborn. But notice again, notice this, that at Zion there will be God, the judge of all. There will be Jesus, the great mediator of the covenant, the one whose blood speaks a better message. Think about this for, for just a second. Under the new covenant at Mount Zion, at Mount Zion, Zion, those are two names that are hard to put together, but we are able to draw near to God Almighty and, and then one day we will be able to stand in his presence and see him in all his glory. You know, I've, I've asked before, you know, and, and it continues to strike me this week again, I, you know, why do you want to go to heaven? 
You know, I remember when I was saved at five years old, the reason why I wanted to go to heaven was simply because I didn't want to go to hell. Right? Now, I'll stand here today and say I still don't want to go to hell. But one of the things that I've realized as God has continued to grow me in my faith is that there's two reasons I now don't want to, there's two reasons I now want to go to heaven. The first is because I just want to see my God in all his glory. The second one is because I want to be done with sin. And so again, we see the promise, we see the hope. But under the new covenant at Mount Z- uh, we, we have the ultimate mediator, the one who stands on our behalf, the one who died and rose again, the one who is interceding for me, the one who took the fear and the punishment of, Zion, uh, of Sinai and transferred us to Zion. The mediator whose blood speaks a better word than Abel's. Now, that phrase, even as we get into Hebrews chapter 11, that phrase really stood out to me. And I was like, what does that mean? Like, what's God saying in that phrase? And as I studied it this week, I was, I was getting more and more excited about it. Because, you see, the blood of Abel, and this is the point that, that, this is the, point that the writer of Hebrews is making. The blood of Abel cries for vengeance. The blood of Abel cries for justice. Right? So on the screen, as you see, back in Genesis chapter 4, after Cain kills Abel, God comes to Cain and says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. The message of the blood of Abel is one of vengeance and one of justice. But here comes the message of the blood of Christ. It's one of forgiveness. It's one of atonement. It's one of redemption. Again, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Here it is. And our hearts sprinkled clean by what? By the blood of Jesus Christ from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Notice again, these two men, Jesus and Abel, were both murdered. But their blood speaks a different message. Their blood speaks of, one speaks of vengeance, the injustice, the other speaks of forgiveness and mercy and nearness to God. And so as we think about these two covenants, as we think about these two mountains, I want to ask you, which one are you standing on this morning? Are you thinking that you can still earn your salvation? Let Sinai remind you that we can't approach God because he's so holy and we are not. But let Sinai point you to Zion and to the new covenant through which he has opened the door to do what? To draw near to God. Again, I was reminded of Ephesians 2.13. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought what? Brought near by the blood of Christ. He reminds the people, notice this again. Notice as he starts verse 22, I want us to understand this. See this, underline it, highlight it. He says to them, he says, this is what you had, but you have come. You have come to Zion. And so look forward. Don't grow weary. Rejoice. Hold fast. Fix your eyes ahead. And never forget that God is still holy and he is unapproachable. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ and through the new covenant, God has opened the door for us to draw near to him. And that leads us to point number two. And here's point number two this morning, and it's the warning. It's the warning. We've talked about this throughout the whole book of Hebrews, that a number of points throughout the, throughout the book, the writer of Hebrews gives us these warnings. And he gives us these warnings today in this passage in verses 12, 25 to 27 and then verse 29. Because look at them there with me. Verse 25, he says, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they, do not, if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is the things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Now jump down to verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. There's a lot in this section, and so I want to summarize it in one main point. And it's simply this. Don't take lightly the judgment of God. Do not take lightly the judgment of God. There are far too many people who are buying into the lie that God will not judge. 
There are far too many people who are buying into this lie that there is no place called hell. There's far too many people who are buying in the lie that all people are going to go to heaven. And yet, Scripture reminds us that nothing could be further from the truth. As we have talked about last, as we talked about this last Sunday, we cannot simply just focus on the love and the grace and the mercy of God without understanding the holiness, the wrath, and His justice. We need the whole. We need the whole picture. You see, just as he did not at Sinai, he will not today. God will not or cannot stand in the presence of sin. He is too holy. That has never changed. But again, we're reminded, thanks be to God, through Christ he has opened the door in which we are able to stand. And that's why, the, that's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he says, For our sake he made him who knew no sin to become sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In him. And yet as we consider the story of the children of Israel, we are reminded that they, and also we are reminded that we, take the judgment of God too lightly. If you look back to Hebrews chapter 3, it'll be on the screen for you, but if you look back to Hebrews chapter 3, The writer of Hebrews reminds us that the children of Israel constantly put God to the test. And we see there in verses 3, 7 to 11, we read, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test, and saw my works for 40 years. What were the works that he saw? They had to wander around the wilderness for 40 years. Because of their testing, because of their disobedience to God. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Understand, God's judgment is real. And he uses their story to challenge the Jewish people. And he uses their story to challenge you and I today in verse 12 of chapter 3 by saying, Therefore, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Now, as we come back to chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews is saying, now I want you to think about this for a second. As he's saying this, he says, If the children of Israel who were spoken to on earth, if they, were, if, they, if they ignored it and they didn't get away with it, the writer of Hebrews is saying, what makes you think that it's going to be any less for us who's ignoring the warnings from heaven? Who's ignoring all the stories because of the fact that God gave us his son, God gave us his spirit, God gave us his word to declare to us about the judgment and we chose to ignore it. You see, I understand this morning, God is going to judge. And God is going to bring this earth to an end and only the ones that will survive that judgment is the ones who have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. We've talked about this a number of times. This is not just about coming to church. This is not just simply about reading the Bible or praying. This is about surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ. And I want us to see the seriousness of God's judgment. Mount Sinai shook with thunder, shook with lightning, shook with the voice of God. But notice Haggai chapter 2 verse 6, which is what the writer of Hebrews quotes in verse 26. Look at it there in verse 26. He says, yet once more, notice this, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven to show what is eternal. In other words, you think that God's judgment was, was, was real and fierce back then. One more time, he's going to do it, but he's not just going to shake the earth. He's going to shake heaven with it. And so we need to be reminded because throughout Scripture, we're told of the greater judgment that's coming. Look at the verses on the screen. I want to give you three verses, and there are so many that I could have pointed to, but we used three verses this morning to remind us of the seriousness of this judgment. The first one's Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, where he says, And many of those who slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, but notice this, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Second Peter chapter 3, if you get a chance to read Second Peter chapter 3 this afternoon, it talks, about the, it talks about this coming judgment. But there Peter says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. 
And then, of course, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and notice this, and after that comes the judgment. And so let me ask, us, let me ask each of us today, if the day of shaking was to happen today, would you be shaken or would you remain? If God were to call us into, again, we need to be reminded of this. I was reminded of this through Psalm 103 this morning. Our lives are like flowers and, and grass. They fade. We don't, know what he, we don't know that moment where we will be called into eternity. Will we be with him or separated from him? Over and over again, the writer of Hebrews reminds us, do not harden your hearts towards the Lord, towards the gift that he gave when he came into this world through his son to live a perfect life, to take your sin and my sin upon his shoulders, to bear the wrath of God and to bear the judgment of God that you and I deserved. He was died, he died, he was buried, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and one day, and thanks be to God, we hold on to this, one day he will return. And so today, is your heart softened before the Lord? By the work of the Spirit. Understand, it's by the work of the Spirit. Just because, and I'll say this without apology, just because you are sitting in this building does not mean that your heart is not hardened before the Lord. And so that's why Paul says, and and I echo these words this morning from 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Remembering what? Remembering as the writer of Hebrews says in verse 29. Look at verse 29. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. This is not necessarily a characteristic that we always like to think about God, but remembering this again. God is a consuming fire. He will consume those who will not turn to him. And so that leads us to point number three. And here's point number three. So let's take the warning seriously. But here comes point number three. Let's take the response to the unshakable kingdom. So as we come to verse 28, we're reminded, the writer has just reminded the people in verse 22 that they came to Zion. He's reminded them in verse 26 that there will be those who will not be shaken but remain after, this, after God shakes the kingdom. But then he comes to verse 28 and he says, Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Do you notice the wording though? Let me start with this wording right now. It says, therefore let us be grateful for what? For receiving. Understand this again. Not for earning, as if we did something, but for receiving a kingdom. A gift. The gift of grace. And as we belong as believers to the only kingdom in history, and understand this morning, it is the only kingdom in history that will not be shaken, that will not be defeated, that will not end. There is a reason why Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Then our response is this, gratefulness and worship. So let's look at the first response. There he says there, look again. Therefore, let us be what? Let us be grateful. As we consider this first response, and this was a huge challenge in my own heart this week, I wonder how grateful are we? How thankful are we that we belong to a kingdom that will not end, that will not be shaken? How grateful are we for the fact that we have an inheritance that, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us, he has caused us, not us caused us, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation that ready to be revealed at the last time. How grateful are we for that? Is that something that we take for granted? And I think if we're honest, that you, I, I would say yes. But as I've said before, and as we can, will continue to say, every single day, no matter what circumstance we face, when we have come to a faith in Jesus Christ, every day we get up, we have a reason to be thankful. One of the marks of a genuine believer, as we see throughout Scripture, one of the marks of a genuine believer is the attitude of gratefulness. I was challenged by that as we thought about our men's retreat, as we we talked about at our men's retreat. 
one of the greatest, one of the greatest counteractions to, to addictions is thankfulness to God. And that, that hit me so hard. When we understand how grateful, how thankful, how, what all that God has done for us, it puts our mindsets into a whole new perspective. To look at some of the verses on the screen for you that will show you some of this. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 to 16 says, and the peace of, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were indeed called, were called into one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. With what? With thankfulness in your hearts to God. When God uses two words in two verses, it's pretty important for us to take note of them. He calls us to be thankful. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is the will of Christ. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. As we consider because of Christ that we are part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, does that reflect in our thankfulness to the Lord? Not in some circumstances, not in most circumstances, but in all circumstances. Are we growing in our gratitude towards God? Secondly, we see our response is worship. So we see gratefulness and worship. Look again, verse, uh, verse 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God. Now notice this key word. Acceptable worship. There's a lot of times that our worship is not acceptable to the Lord. Why? Because we're not doing it with our whole being. We're not doing it with our whole heart. But let us be thankful. Or let us be thankful and let us worship with God with an acceptable worship. Let me say again too, again, if we are, if we are worshiping God and yet still wanting to hang on to sin, still not letting sin go as we talked about last Sunday or two Sundays ago, where we're not putting aside the hindrances, it's not acceptable. We need to come before the Lord in confession, in forgiveness. Again, think about, think about 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As Paul challenges as we come to the communion table, he reminds us again, do not come in an unworthy manner. And so we must be reminded again that our worship must be acceptable and it must be done so in reverence and in awe of God. Why? Because he's the only one that's worthy of our praise. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Please understand this morning, worship is not an activity that we do for one hour a day, for one hour a week, on a Sunday morning in a building on 8 South Avenue in Austin. Worship is a lifestyle. Worship is, worship is singing, yes, but it cannot only be singing. And we must continue to remember again, that we are being called to, have, to, be, to live lives of worship. We talked about Psalm 103 this morning in our prayer time. Psalm 103, verse 1 to 2. Notice these words. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Notice this phrase. And forget, all his ben- and, and do, and forget not all his benefits. As we go through, maybe, and maybe this is your word, maybe this is a word for you this morning, is just the fact that, honestly, today, go home, write down all the things that God has done for you in your life as you consider them, and not, and not generalities, be specific into what God has done for you in, in his life. Be specific about God's character. I love, that's why we talked about Psalm 103 this morning. I love God's character, just go, walking through God's character. Go through all those things, and if you're not worshiping by, like, maybe, like, number three, and start asking, is, your, is my heart really, is my heart softened before the Lord? You see, there are many people today who are putting their hope in the things of this world. In their families, in their health, in, and they, and, in, in, in the things around them, their jobs, their money. And they're all fleeting. They're all fleeting. But yet, today, we're reminded that we have reason to be thankful. We have reason to worship in reverence and awe. Why? Because as followers of Jesus Christ, we belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken, no matter what we face. John Newton, of course, the famous writer of this hymn, Amazing Grace, wrote another song, and he wrote these words. He said, and I'd never heard this hymn before, but he said, let us love and sing and wonder. Let us praise the Savior's name. He has hushed the, loud, loud, uh, the law's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. 
He has washed us in his blood. He has brought us nigh to God. Writer of Hebrews reminds the people, you have come to Mount Zion. I pray today that would be true of you and I. So why don't we pray as we close? And so, Father, I, I thank you so much for the fact that you have moved us from, Zion, from Sinai to Zion. You have moved us from being away from a place that, of not being able to approach you to by the new and living way that you have opened for us through the curtain. That is through Christ's flesh. And since we have a priest over the house of God, we can draw near to you with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Father, I pray that you would help us to take serious the warning that you have given us of your judgment, knowing that every one of us will stand before the judgment seat and you are a consuming fire. And so, Father, I thank you. I thank you today for sending Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of God, through whom we can be set free from the wrath of God. And so, Father, I pray this morning that if there is one who has not heeded this warning of judgment and embraced Christ, then today you would soften their hearts. And, Father, that they would respond to the call. But, Lord, I pray for those of us who belong to the unshakable kingdom. Father, would you help us? Would you help us to live with grateful hearts that worship you in reverence and in awe, that worship you with an acceptable worship, for you are truly worthy of it all. Until that day where we stand in your presence and we see you in all your glory and we truly are able to say, how great is our God. And so we pray all these things to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Tim and Janet.